This is The Boys Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're back with the finale of The Boys, Season 4, Episode 8, Assassination Run. Tell me I'm the smartest superhero in the Seven. You are by far the smartest superhero in the Seven. You're, you're brilliant, a genius. And that you respect me the most? Besides Homelander, of course. Of course, of course I respect you. You're amazing. You're just saying that because you're scared, aren't you? No, I'm not. I swear. Yeah, you are. But you know what, bro? That's good enough for me. Welcome back, fellow boys and girls, to the finale of The Boys Season 4. We're chatting about Assassination Run on this week's podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow boys and girls. Yes, we are two fingers deep, and I am one of your other hosts, John. <laughs> Make that three fingers deep, because <laughs> I am here too. I am Chris. Welcome back, Chris. In your deep and booming voice. <laughs> yes, yes. I was away getting a brand new uh, voice transplant uh, or uh, joining WITSEC or who knows? I just, I, yeah, no, I was away. I was traveling. I was vacationing. Mm-hmm. I was looking after a sick child. I was getting a child into crash. It was everything and all in one. The perfect two weeks, you may say. Exactly. Yes. Uh, but away from us. And uh, there has been a question that uh, we've we've been wondering about uh, since you went away uh, about the boys. Chris, there's other questions that we also were wondering about. But the big question that came up was uh, the boys introduced their version of um, Spider-Man to the Mm -hmm. boys universe uh, over the last couple of episodes. And you weren't here for it. Uh, Yeah. And as as the biggest Spider-Man fan we know, uh, we wanted to know what your thoughts about Web Weaver and uh, I guess his treatment at the hands of uh, both the seven. Literally everyone. uh, Everyone else. Yes. Uh, Yeah. Including Tech Knight uh, and uh, Huey's version of Web Weaver uh, getting... um, a, a, a terrible, terrible day, let's say. Would you like to have been in Mother Milk's uh, position? Oh, the multiple uh, explosions, let's call it. Mm. Um, it'd be definitely, it, it would be a webtastic, webheading uh, adventure. <laughs> it was fun. It's the boys. I love The costume's cool. I will give it credit okay. where credit's due. The costume <laughs> was very cool. Smelled pretty uh, bad, apparently. Uh, yeah. Apparently. Built-in yes. web slingers. Uh-huh. Like, didn't need mm-hmm. the devices. That's right. Straight out the top of the bomb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah, the, the, other the, yeah. The, the small of the back. Small yes. of the back, yeah. Top of there the bomb. There you go. Uh, some may call it a tramp stamp. We call it a, a, a web shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, look, it was very cool. Costume was cool. Way better than, say, um, Ezekiel's in uh, Madame Web. Um, okay. So very close to it, actually. Some could right. say they took some <laughs> liberties. Um, or each to their own. Uh, Huey looked great in it. Uh-huh. The storyline was fun. Mm-hmm. It Tech Knight being Tech Knight, great. Um, Ashley doing Ashley things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and the, uh, whoever was playing, um, Tech Knight's, uh, Tech Boy sidekick, mm. um, I'm still so interested to find out who was in that <laughs> costume because I'm pretty sure they're going to turn around and say it was like someone from one of the supernatural, yeah, or uh, kind of, <laughs> it'd be like Ryan Reynolds because it was red. Oh, maybe, maybe, or yeah, <laughs> like it could it, it could actually cool. be uh, be Jared Padalecki. Um, we know that Eric Kripke's reached out to him for an appearance in The Boys. Um, uh, maybe that was the appearance. He wasn't <laughs> waiting for season five to appear as a brand new big character. He was just playing a Tech Knight's Tech Boy. Dare I say it? He, he didn't look big enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jared Padalecki looks much bigger than that. You're right. He looks oh my God, much that's probably, that yeah. could be Eric Kripke himself. It could be. <laughs> But overall, I look, I really, really have enjoyed these last few episodes. I think you guys were on Twitter and um, uh, Chio Coker basically was talking about the, the last episode, uh, episode seven, mm-hmm. and basically saying, um, my God, has anyone watched it? And I assume Derek, it was probably yourself who replied going, yeah. yeah, they're pretty prophetic in this one. And it's kind of scarily on point. Um, 
watching this over the last few weeks, uh-huh. I've just been like, oh my God, this was written like, t- let's say, eight to 12 months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, these guys are supernatural. <laughs> um, literally. Yeah, I, I think I said the, this, the, the show tends to be quite prophetic in uh, where it expects the uh, the US to go. Um, but last episode was a bit was like it was written by the precogs from uh, from Minority Report because it was uh, it was specifically predicting uh, something that was going to happen within the week. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is quite a quite a different uh, poll, I guess, looking on uh, the episodes when you're looking at them in the context of what's going on in the real world out there. But uh, but we're not going to talk about that. We are going to no. talk about the boys, of course, uh, the show itself, um, and exactly. we will get into spoilers for the finale episode. But glad you're all caught up, Chris, and glad you glad you enjoyed uh, the version of Web. We were we were just laughing about the fact that the first episode was Batman versus Spider Man, and the second episode was effectively Superman versus Spider Man. <laughs> so and Spider Man doesn't come out very well uh, either. His, uh, his battle with Batman or yeah. his battle with Superman uh, being ripped in half by uh, by their version of Superman here as well, yeah. But I will give it to Amazon. They keep giving us their version of Spider-Man because they can't get their own. So we've had it in Invincible and we've had it in The Boys. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. Right, uh, th- that's Chris's thoughts on the last couple of episodes. We'll get into our thoughts on the finale. But before we do, let's get into some feedback from our wonderful fellow boys and girls. First up, Meryl Smith says, Something that I've been thinking about is during the Gen V finale, where it was shown that Marie and the others were were locked up, possibly in another version of The Woods, while in The Boys it's said in the news that they're on the run. And in what I think is the vault spin doctors doing work exactly the way they do it best. They have people looking for them outside while they're actually inside. It's a classic misdirection tactic. If they really had gotten away, we would have we would have seen it on screen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, la- the last time we saw them in Gen V, all those characters were locked up in uh, yeah. in uh, in, a, in an A prison, weren't they? So, um, so yeah, so it could be, or something's happened in between uh, season one of Gen V and um where that was revealed in uh, in the boys and we'll see it at the start of Gen V season 2. Oh yeah, that could also make sense cuz they may make it run concurrent season 2 of uh Gen V is happening during see this season yeah. for of the boys yeah. and then everything kind of syncs up at the end for the next seasons. Yeah, but potentially we we do know that and Eric Kripke said this that um Gen V season one leads into uh, the boys season four. We've now seen that on screen and we'll talk about it a bit later on in the episode. But he also said going back into Gen V season two, that will lead directly off of the boys season four as well. So, uh, uh, so there will be, it may be just the first two episodes take place during this time in these, in these eight episodes of, uh, of the boys. And then it continues on to another story. Um, but again, we'll talk about that uh, as we get to the characters from Gen V. <laughs> Well, I think you could find the boys ending up in the same facility where the Gen V are. Potentially, yeah. Yep. Potentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thanks so much, Mer- Meryl, for your thoughts. Uh, yeah. Next up, we got an email in from Coffee and Vodka, who says, Greetings, fellow christmas tacular defenders. A middling episode of the boys is better than the best of anything out there right now. And while this wasn't middling by any means, it was a very apparent rush job to further along plot points. Armchair show running. I'd say they have done well to either add a couple of episodes or axe the Frenchy guilt trip and Cameco Shining Light subplots. Be that as it may, I'm honestly more curious to see how Homelander deals with his progeny than to see how the assassination attempt goes. Speaking of, hope Sam wasn't watching that particular Christmas special. It may have uh, brought back PTSD for him. Every season has a chosen one to get especially dumped on. This time it's Starlight in the barrel and it'd be nice to let her, one of the few characters that doesn't need redeeming, out soon. Maybe replace her with her mother. Higher standards, my ass. Never thought The Deep would get more dislikable than the very first episode, but Crip gave me once. And R.I.P. Ambrosius. As usual, so much else. Looking forward to next week. Four shredded Websters, stripping skin jobs, and propaganda puppets out of five. Peace and take care. Coffee and vodka. Good stuff, uh, coffee and vodka. Yeah, totally. Uh, the deep uh, getting sort of uh, more despicable mm-hmm. as time goes on here. It'll be interesting now what comes of him uh, over season five yeah. uh, for sure. He's fully over uh, the edge now. Yeah, yeah. R.I.P. Ambrosius indeed. Mm-hmm. And of course, t- uh, the voice of Tilda Swinton. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really hoped actually that Ambrosius was somehow still lurking and was going to, you know, sort of get her revenge on uh, the deep. On the deep, yeah. yeah that would have been good. Uh, an interesting one that came out this week, a little news story from, uh, from Chase Crawford who was saying that he never knew it was Tilda Swinton doing the voice. Uh, of Ambrosius, so he filmed all of 
his scenes, of course, and then they put in Tilda Swinton's voice afterwards. He was like, that's amazing. So he absolutely loved the idea, but didn't know, of course, uh, who his scene partner was, was at the time, apart from it being Ambrosius, the, uh, the octopus. Interesting. <laughs> thanks so much for your thoughts, Coffee and Vodka. Yeah, thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Uh, over on Facebook, uh, we have uh, some feedback from Eugene Basil Abbott, who says, Still haven't watched, but boy, has my house gotten very clean. Again, re-watching and therefore listening along to you guys, I questioned why it would be expected that Ryan would have the same powers as Homelander. I'm thinking there, there must be a genetic component to the powers, though, because while Wee Huey and his dad had different powers, they both were of the teleportation sort. Wee Huey was lucky he never ended up naked standing in the middle of someone else who he exploded from the inside like termite. I have no idea what the finale or season five hold, but if he and Starlight have a kid, would it use electricity to teleport? Also, because I've seen all four seasons and Gen V, if you go back to season three when Huey visits Red River and they're looking for an adoptable child, good cover Huey, they scroll by a photo of Mary. I'm sure that's in an x-ray somewhere because I haven't listened to the Gen V episodes yet. This got long. <laughs> Thanks so much, Eugene. Um, yeah, I think definitely there is some kind of uh, genetic component there going yeah. on. But uh, yeah, good uh, spot around the, the Wee Huey and Hugh Senior in terms of their kind of teleportation type of vibe uh, yeah. that they have. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, it looks if they, the V compound is there because of a birth, then it is, yeah, probably going to be melded in there with the genetics. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's one that we missed completely and definitely confirmed the reason why we, Huey and Huey, have uh, have similar powers in their teleportation abilities because they are uh, connected by family. So there is a genetic uh, piece to it there. But we just missed it. Again, we were recording these episodes before they come out. And there's, there's big things that sometimes we don't catch, uh, that everybody catches. And we feel really, uh, really silly about it that we didn't notice it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you're absolutely right as well. That, that little Easter egg of uh, Marie Moreau being in that uh, in that episode of uh, of. Um, the boys before Gen V had been released. Uh, no way you could have known it when you were watching it first time through until you saw Marie Moreau being such a big character in Gen V. But uh, once, when you're looking back on a rewatch, uh, it definitely stands out that that's who it is. Yeah. And yes, as again, speaking on the genetics, on our Gen V podcast, uh, for those who hopefully will listen to it very soon, um, Polaris and his father, both of them have the exact same power sets. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And it's so pure genetic based. Um, and we go through that because then you also do see that there is that kind of the next generation all seemingly are either as powerful or sometimes more powerful because they're second generation powered with a uh, another soup parent. So they are kind of super powered parentage. Exactly. If you will. <laughs> exactly. Good stuff. Thanks so much for your feedback there, Eugene. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. And we also got some feedback from Scott McAnada, who had this to say, There has to be a reason for Sage to leave her Brave Maeve notebook at the tower. She's been a good guy-ish all along and is trying to co coerce Homie into doing something. Maybe something as simple as reverse psychology or even reverse reverse psychology, knowing that he'll overthink the situation as the smart guy. Probably. Uh, Scott, there could be something to that. Uh, when you're listening to this, there is going to be uh, at the end of this mm -hmm. season, it uh, is collected um, and there is a bit about why she comes back for it. But overall, yeah. Makes sense. It was just a little nod there from the writers, right? Uh, just yeah, just exactly. to say she's coming back for that, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks. Thanks for that, Scott. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, as as Chris said, uh, yeah, you'll see it uh, later on in the episode or in the episode itself. Of course, you've, you've probably seen it at this stage as to why she left it behind there because she was always coming back. Yeah. Yeah, good spot exactly. there, Scott. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, also, we got some feedback in from David, Mr. Writer, who says, well, that's a hell of a cliffhanger in episode seven. Interesting setup for the finale. I love the line where Homelander tells Sage she's lucky he doesn't send her home in a bucket. Also, good on them to pay homage to the Mortal Kombat fatality by ripping apart Webweaver. I think I understand why this season has appeared slow. I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're going to make it into a continuation to season five. This seems to be like one big long setup for the series finale. I also heard that Laz Alonso 
his actual words, not a rumour, chose to lose and cut weight for season four in order to show how much of the toll it takes to be a leader of the boys. So all the speculation of what happened or if he was sick can be laid to rest. This was an artistic choice by him. Very interesting. Um, yeah. You can kind of see it now um, as the seasons have gone on, you know, the, the whole uh, stress and pressure that MM was under uh, really coming through in the performance that uh, Laz Alonso brings to, to MM uh, as a character and how much pressure he's been under, how much uh, danger he feels he's been under as the full-on leader of the boys with Billy uh, sidelined, I guess. Uh, I think so, yeah. And I mean, even it's the being the leader of the boys, but it's also having to deal with the stress of what happened to his family as well. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, no, that's that is a good choice. It's good to to um, hear that from the actor as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And certainly, yeah, the Mortal Kombat uh, fatality, <laughs> especially uh-huh. for Web Weaver. Yeah. Uh, very, very good indeed. Oh, Thanks well. uh, so much, David, Mr. Writer. Yeah. And, and yeah, you are, you are right. It does feel like uh, now that season five has been announced as the final season, this finale of season four with this cliffhanger is leading into season five. So whether it's just a two part series or whether it is just a continued two seasons uh, all combined together. Yeah, I don't think you're going to be able to go into season five having not watched any of the previous four seasons. Let's let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Uh, also uh, on episode seven, we have Dr. Bob Phillips. who says, the mid-season finale is rushing in fast. Possibly one of the best lines was the silent questioning head tilt from Noir as Deep asked about lobotomies. <laughs> also, for those wondering, a thorough knee amputation after displacing the patella would have been quicker than the low femoral approach that Frenchie <laughs> took. Ryan played the Muppet scene really well, highlighting the emotional tutti fruity. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, I think uh, Ryan's Muppet scene, you know, just really good. And actually, I, I quite liked how Ryan has tutti fruity this um, emotionally throughout the whole of this mm-hmm. season because yeah. there was that moment um, a f- few episodes back where he gets one of um like the the main director his you know him to apologize to his assistant yeah. and i thought okay here's ryan going more to the dark side so mm-hmm. i think they've tried to just keep you guessing and that makes sense for this last episode actually Absolutely. uh where he is um sort of being asked to kind of step up really by uh billy butcher yeah yeah, exactly. I yeah, know he's done. He's done a great job. Yeah, will uh, he won't he yeah. is the thing that we will be taking through into season five. Absolutely, that is uh, that's what the show's been about really since the reveal of Ryan at the end of, uh, of yeah. this first season, right? So, um, but he's done a great job since this actor came on in, in season two. He's done a great job of playing Ryan and playing that battle inside his mind of whether he goes with his real father of Homeland or whether he goes with the person he thought of as a dad with uh, with Billy Butcher. So. Yeah. Absolutely, and I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that that age because it, it it really kind of works very well. I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, even you, his voice, you sense his voice is breaking a little yeah. bit, you know, naturally, um, but it seems to work with the character because yeah. that the character's in the same position, and it it, it almost makes him sound nervous when he's talking. Yes. you know, so it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting with Cameron, who the the the, the actor who plays Ryan. Mm. Um, like obviously he did replace, um, the person the, the other actor who was there for like the split second scene at the mm. end. Um, and he has been that character since, but he has aged rapidly because these do take a year to film. Yeah. And although it's supposed to be a lot quicker in like in boys' universe time, I'm really hoping that by the end of season five, he's not just over. He's not it's just like he's already growing his first beard and that type of thing. He's just hip you already. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hope not. And I suppose that's the best thing about the show finishing in season five. We don't have to have that situation where a child actor is supposed to be playing a teenager and has grown and become 30 because uh, the show went yes, on exactly. for 15 seasons or something like that, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I think doing, doing a great job. Uh, excellent stuff. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Uh, Heather Wallace says, Wow, I never thought I'd cheer A Train's entrance. Uh, he and MM were the team up I didn't know I needed. This started with A Train negligently killing Huey's girlfriend and now he saved Huey's new girlfriend although she's in a bad position at the end of the episode and will not be happy with Huey when she escapes I love the different reaction shots of Ryan's two dads Homelander frustrated and and disappointed and Butcher so very proud as truly awful and irredeemable as Homelander is he does love Ryan just not in a way to see Ryan as his own person 
I have a missing Kamiko and Frenchie's closeness. It was a relief when she moved over to make room for him to sit down. And then he had to chop her leg off. <laughs> One episode to go. <laughs> you know, there's about four sentences in there, Heather, that you wouldn't get in any other TV Absolutely. show ever other than The Boys, really, is there? <laughs> yeah, they were getting closer and then he chopped her leg off. <laughs> then he had to off. chop her leg off. Yeah. His two well, dads he chopped, yeah. saw through her leg yeah. and bare. I think it's one of the more visceral uh, sort of leg chopping off I've ever seen. It is. Like, I think it's, a bit, it's better than any zombie one I've seen, actually, to be honest. Um, yeah. I, I still say Herschel's leg in, in season three of uh, of um, Walking Dead is amazingly visceral. I think this one worked really well because it was In Time to Steal My Sunshine by Len, that terrible 90s song. Well, I'll repeat my, my comment that it's a terrible 90s song because I know that's, uh, that uh, not everybody agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> So you're just going to keep saying it until yeah. someone else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is a terrible song, uh, but that is a, it is a great moment, and uh, yeah, it was really visceral as well. But uh, again, a great, a great boys moment that you wouldn't get in most other shows. Most <laughs> of the shows. <laughs> Good stuff. Guys, that is it for our feedback from our wonderful boys and girls on the last episode we mentioned last week when we we're doing our wrap up episode of The Boys. Uh, you can get your feedback in for the finale. We will discuss it on there along with uh, giving out all the answers to the pub quiz. Uh, we have one final question of the pub quiz coming up towards the so end of the episode. Do. And all you need to do is to gather together all eight answers to the pub quiz. Email them to us at feedback at TV podcast industries dot com and you can be on the chance of getting your hands on some boys goodies in next week week's episode yes absolutely boys and girls fellow quizzes mm-hmm. get those answers rolling in after this episode excellent absolutely after the question for this episode has been given out and if you missed any of the questions you can pop on over to our website of course at tvpodcastindustries.com uh, all the questions are up there at the moment so excellent uh well derek then let us get into our spoiler filled review for the finale episode of the boys season four assassination run what are some of the episode details? Well, of course, the showrunner for the show is Eric Kripke. He has been the showrunner since season one of the show. Uh, this is based on the comic book series from Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson. <laughs> the executive producers for the show are Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. This episode was written by Jessica Chow and David Reed. This is Jessica's third episode after writing an episode, the episode Hero Orgasm last season and episode two of this season. And she also wrote an episode of Gen V. Uh, this is David's fourth episode of The Boys, including the first episode of this season and the finale of season three. So he's kind of keeping that story going uh, through out the seasons I wouldn't be surprised if he gets the first episode of season 5 as well uh, to keep that story mm, going let's see yeah. yeah and this episode was directed by showrunner Eric Kripke putting his stamp on the, on the last episode of season 4 nice very good yeah. John do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for The Boys season 4 episode 8 Assassination Run sure it's January the 6th as Congress certifies the election results to officially make Bob Singer president and Victoria Newman his VP. But when Homelander reveals the truth about Newman on live TV, it sends Congress and the entire nation into an uproar. Meanwhile, the boys try to protect Singer from assassination, not realising that the assassin is closer than they think. Annie struggles to figure out who Annie January really is and to break free from captivity. And when Butcher makes his final attempt to convince Ryan to leave Homelander, things go horribly wrong, causing Butcher to embrace the monster within, and nothing will ever be the same again. That's a pretty good synopsis of uh, of what happens in the episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Literally nothing will be the same again. Yeah. yeah. It's all changed at the top. It's all changed. And uh, a really good a really good thing to mention there, I think I said it on last week's episode when we were podcasting that January 6th is Inauguration Day in the US. That was totally an error on my side. I should have remembered that's the day that Congress certifies the election. It's nothing to do with the inauguration that happens way after the election has been certified. That's what caused all the problems in the US at the time of the uh, certification of the election on January 6th. And now the date lives on in infamy, as, as I had said last week. But I uh, completely messed up my days. I, I don't know enough about American politics obviously. <laughs> well, infamy, infamy. Yeah. We've all got it in for me. Exactly. <laughs> let's move it on to a lighter note. Yes, let's get on to our main moments from the episode. We're going to start out with our boys moment, as usual, our protagonist moment for the episode. Oi, oi. Did you hear Billy Butcher answering his phone like that in this episode? It just made me laugh because we've been using that clip, which I think is from <laughs> season yeah. one of the show. But he picks up his phone to Huey and goes, oi, oi, immediately. I was just quite happy with that. But anyway, <laughs> who wants to kick us off with the first point? Chris, do you want to take first point? I will, just because it is a bit of a oi, oi moment. Um, bangers and mash, 
uh, kiss and caboodle, kid and caboodle, all the Cockney slang you can think of for a kiss heard around the world, perfectly framed on a walkway. Yes, Frenchie and Kimiko have finally kissed. What's the bangers and mash? Uh, Cockney rhyme and slang? They're, they're starting to do the baggers of mash. <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to smash? make it work there. They're I, smash. I think it's just Londonisms. They're not cockney, cockney rhyme and slang, uh, okay. to be honest. Uh, in fact, you'd probably hear baggers mash all across England. But anyway, it doesn't matter <laughs> at all. You, you, all you tried, Chris. I, we, we I got tried. It. We got it. <laughs> um, Were you as shocked at this as I yes. was, Chris? I was yeah. absolutely shocked after everything they've gone through with Kamiko and, and Frenchie that, uh, that they they put the characters together here and have them have a massive smooch uh, <laughs> on screen after everything they've gone through the last two seasons. I was surprised. I, I honestly, I thought this was off the table. Yeah. I thought that they had set this like to go, no, do you know what? Look, these two are better as friends. Yeah. And to somewhat take that back. I will not somewhat to fully take that back and say that it was said because they need both needed to go on their journey through mm-hmm. this season to get to this point is impressive. Yeah. It, it, like, and it, it makes it also more sweet and then bittersweet at the end of this mm-hmm. episode, um, for they, that they are where they are. Um, because it is this constant, I'm going to call it Romeo and Juliet, but there's probably a better analogy in like literature where they are constantly ripped from each other. They, right. they cannot, they're star cross lovers. Yeah. As much as they want to be together, fate is just constantly getting in the way, be it fate of their own doing, yeah. be it the, 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 the universe, be it the job they have, but they have finally made that call. And two quick parts. One, the choice by Kripke to frame that kiss on the walkway mm-hmm. in the, like nothing else going on around them. Just beautiful. It yeah. looked spectacular. It was a really nice shot. And then just the little silly, the, the emojis text that she showed Starlight Danny. Yes. And it was just like just a the French little, man, the French flag, a French yeah. flag. Yeah. And then a kiss. I was like, yeah. We all just went, oh, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> um, yeah. It was a nice ending to that, to the, the, the story the two of them have been on throughout this season. Yeah. And as you say, it's not the ending of the episode. There's other things that happen afterwards. And uh, we'll uh, probably go into those, I guess, uh, as, as yeah. we go through the episode. But ha- to have this moment where the two of them uh, rekindle their love. You know, there is a there is an old trope of this. I know you, you, know, you mentioned Romeo, Romeo and Juliet, Chris. But of course, there is a trope of the will they, won't they characters on sci-fi shows and on comedy shows all the time it was two characters that are destined to be together but always being pulled apart things like the ross and rachel and friends yep. and diane and sam on cheers you know those characters that were always supposed to be together but you know fought throughout the years or couldn't be together for whatever reason that's exactly chuck what they've Sarah done here with uh, chuck. okay uh that's what they've done here with Frenchie and, and uh kimiko you know they've, they've made them into the will they won't they characters and i thought it was they won't at the start of the season. <laughs> that's that's what I thought they were going for. Nope, they're not going to be together. And then to end the season with the two of them together, uh, or at least at that point, was yeah. just a big surprise for me. But uh, but a nice moment, a lovely moment. They're yeah, great. They're both was. great characters. Yeah, and it just sets up the heartbreak for next season. Absolutely. Now by the end of this episode, they are separated, and well, yeah. they definitely separated. Yep. And it just brings way more questions into because of how they are separated. Mm-hmm. Will he even remember? Yeah, who she is, who they are, who he is, exactly. etc. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, like for me, I think you know their their storyline in some ways has been so tragic all the way through. And to be honest, this last episode is, you know, the end of Empire Strikes Back. It's yeah. pretty yeah. grim if yeah. you're uh, rooting for the boys, Sleep and then um, that kiss is just that little bit of hope Mm -hmm. in amongst all of this from the boys side i mean even just all the way through like where she's cleaning the the bloody teddy bear at the start you know um i thought that was quite cute as well so i I guess um, the one that was covered with her blood from last week's episode exactly yeah Yeah. um so that i kind of like that but i wasn't expecting it at all yeah 
Yeah. yeah. But I'm, expensive. yeah, fair juice. I guess it will be really tragic. Mm-hmm. It'll, it'll, it'll lock into the Shakespearean tragedy then in, in season five. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you got somewhere slightly deep ahead of me. You you brought in the Empire um, reference, so thank you. Mm-hmm. I was almost expecting the I love you, I know. Right, yeah. Because of the way this ended, yeah. and except that like, I was because it, it very clearly this is their empire season mm-hmm. going into return for next season. Could see that, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, and because they had got them together, similar to Han and Leia, mm-hmm. and then you tear them apart at the end. I was expecting her to sign that or some form of that because just to kind of really kind of cement it with yeah. the nerds. Yeah, but they didn't, and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe next time. I think it's enough that it took place in a warehouse that looks uh, similar to the kind of place they would have filmed Empire Strikes yeah. Back <laughs> with, yeah. with a little more set dressing, of course, in Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> but but no, it's it's really good, a really good call out. Uh, that's how I do. I definitely want to make sure that we put a pin on in in what happens to them at the end because there's a the one other little touch uh, to what happens at the end that we definitely should be talking about. So but we're going to hold that off on that finale and the wrap up of the episode until our exactly. other outstanding moments um is that is that all you have on on French that's all of yeah. that's from my boys and can we go cool uh john what about your boys moment uh, i think my uh boys moment is just all the boys sort of getting together uh the the, the team getting together to go uh, and protect president elect uh singer who's i love you know four stories underground in the the suit proof bunker really uh-huh. um playing mini golf <laughs> which of course comes back to to bite him uh on on the ass really mm. uh in the sort of the greater scheme of things um from the wizard sage but uh, i i just kind of like this i liked um the fact that you have them all claustrophobically sort of in this underground bunker uh to protect uh singer from homelander um and you have this moment of realization then that Huey knows that Starlight isn't Starlight here mm-hmm. in the bunker, locked in. And there's just some really nice touches here. Um, you know, as the the doppelganger shapeshifter, and you have Huey telling um Mother's Milk to just look forward, don't look at her, you know, keep it natural, and it starts to go and be anything but natural. Mm-hmm. And like the doppelganger picks up on it with, you know, mother's milk squeezing his hand, the sort of side glances from, from Huey. And then she goes, Oh, you've noticed. And it's the ring. And I yeah. kind of liked just how they built up the tension here. It was good fun. Yeah. I mean, even to the point that once, you know, fake starlight is unleashed here, I mean, the fight is just really good. I wouldn't like to be one of the Secret Service men uh, in in this uh, oh, particular yeah. situation where yeah. you've got the uh, the right angled back uh, k- kill. There's yeah. the coat hook kill, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and there's the putter uh, yeah. kill as well. And I mean, all this really explosive, really fast. You know almost Terminator esque in um, the efficiency of the kills and. <laughs> You just see them trying to get uh, President Singer out the big bomb blast doors. <laughs> it's taking <laughs> forever to open. So good. And just what a way such to a wrap great up little yeah. Yeah, juxtaposition. <laughs> and even a bit later where they're going through another set and he was just like, how many numbers are there for this code? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like Mother's Milk <laughs> is just like running through all the numbers I right. think of. And um, so I just kind of like this whole thing because, <laughs> you know, in a sense, everything going abo- on above ground was just there's a sinisterness to it and i mean it, it's mm-hmm. to the point i think this season really is where it's still joking about all this stuff but actually it's almost as well playing out in real time <laughs> i mean it's like so weird like there's actual the stuff that's happening here is playing out in real time and mm-hmm. we're kind of pretending that this is all like um jokey and um you know satire in a sense yeah. but it it is 
you know, the, the usual thing with certain politicians on the other side of the Atlantic, such as Boris Johnson, were mm. basically all the satirists went, well, satire is dead. What can we do now that is going to trump any of this? Yeah. Pardon the pun. Um, and, <laughs> of course, so I kind of like this underground thing because it was totally sort of just devoid of all of that. And it... it, it you know, it it spoke to kind of almost that, tr- you know, just the the, the storyline of Starlight's been kidnapped. She's been replaced with a doppelganger, yep. and now they're in this pressure situation. But there's so much kind of jokey stuff going around, and I thought it was classic. I just thought it was classic. Yes. Boys really enjoyed it, Absolutely. and it had a bit of fighting, awkwardness. You know, carried the plot forward, mm-hmm. and was used later on to effectively, you know. Um, hang S- Singer and get him arrested. Yeah. Um, so I, I just really like this whole uh, bit in the bunker. Yeah, and one other thing I really did like about it is also that it showed the intelligence of MMM, why he's the leader of the boys. He gets everybody into that group, uh, into that room to make sure that President Singer is safe. But the first thing he says is, we're not definitely going to be safe in here. The person could already be in yeah. here that's going to assassinate you. We could we could be putting you in a sealed room. So he knows that he is looking out for clues. He's making sure that everybody checks in and that everybody keeps in contact and keeps their eyes peeled. It's not let's all sit down and chill out, uh, wait for it all to blow over. He is thinking <laughs> about uh, that. There's a possibility that someone's in here, and it turns out he's right. You know, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially he could have made the Shaun of the Dead reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going to uh, reference things the way you think they're going to reference things, yeah, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that. I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed every part of this. Mm-hmm. So I, I'll be, I, I'll kind of level because I would have talked about this in the previous episodes mm-hmm. if we, if I was on it. The shapeshifter I felt was a bit of a going to be a scapegoat, right? Because uh, it was like, oh yeah, you've done the shapeshifter before. Okay, where are you going with this? Uh-huh. It just makes okay. They use it to such good effect here because yeah. the shapeshifter does have some telepathy as well. Yeah. And is able to read the mind and is able to take it. And you do start to quite well, will, is Huey going to be blinded by all the silly things uh, that kind of is going on and the multiple uh, rounds of uh, pillow uh, gymnastics that goes on? Uh, <laughs> definitely less than 20. Uh, yeah, uh, right. definitely less. Yes, I definitely think. less than twenty. I think maybe, um, yeah. maybe. <laughs> um, but then they 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 use it, and then like for example, that fight we've already seen how versatile that shapeshifter is. Mm-hmm. She's pretty indestructible as yeah. well. Like I was yeah. kind of like. I was kind of fairly shocked by that. I didn't realize effectively she was going to be bulletproof. Yeah. No, exactly. And then to see, like, she just gets choked out. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure that 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 she may still be alive. They mm, I did think alive. that as well. So that's interesting. There's a line from Annie when she comes back to really rip uh, Huey a new one. And she says, oh, you gave her the engagement ring. I know because I pulled it off her cold, dead finger. <laughs> and she's so angry about it that I think she checked for a pulse. Um, so okay, I, I think Annie January is confirming she killed the shapeshifter because of her wheedling her way into Huey's life and getting engaged to him and Huey not knowing the difference. I think she is angry as all hell and she not only choked that thing out, she strangled it, ripped off its head and then ripped off the ring as well. <laughs> I, I do hope that. I do hope that yeah. because... And Kimiko full on gets an exorcist moment. Yeah, she does. Yeah. Wow. Like I, I, I for a split second was like, wait, no. Yeah. Like I, I, like I knew she's been through worse things, but I did think for a split second, wait, are they just gonna take her off the table for like and like half of the the episode? Mm. Just because, like, how do you come back from that so quick? But then she came back from it so quick. Yeah, yeah. It, it's weird actually because with Kimiko getting sort of, yeah her her neck broken. Mm. When she was coming round, I thought she would be confronted with the two starlights and not know which one to go after. Yeah. So it was actually, even sort of with the real starlight having choked out fake starlight, Mm -hmm. I thought, but is Kamiko going to know that that's the real starlight? Yeah. Um, Yeah. But she is wearing something different, absolutely. So you can tell from that. But I just thought there was going to be that kind of, uh, moment uh, yeah. where it's like who's who here and having to figure that out exactly. um i mean in the sense that you know huey and starlight have got some difficult things to chat through but mm-hmm. i think in the end she does accept the fact that you know 
she was a very good doppelganger. She told Starlight as well that she can take her memories because she talks about using yes. her grandparents' one on yeah. Huey. Yeah. So Starlight does know that, you know, and I mean, that does change the game a bit with um, the shapeshifters that yeah. it's not just a physical manifestation. It exactly. is a personality as well. Because yeah. we were talking about it last week. There was kind of a, there's a moment when the shapeshifter took uh, the the um, laptop from Huey's safe in the house and the only way she could possibly have known the code was that she had some of the memories of Starlight. So we knew that there was something different. It wasn't just a take on the appearance of somebody who takes on all their memories and takes on all their knowledge as well. So that makes them so much more scary. Uh, that moment when she's describing uh, when the first time she transformed was when she was what six years old at preschool transformed into her teacher and knew everything about her teacher knew that knew that she was having sex with one of the neighbors uh, was justifying it all to herself you know as a six-year-old she suddenly had all that inside her brain and that's what turned her into a sociopath you know? so um I, I thought that was really again it's how they think about all the angles of these characters that they introduce even for an episode or two it just uh, is always very good so yeah. um yeah i like that a lot um but yeah just that i think annie uh threatens huey with having to go and get every single uh, std test in the world to make sure that he doesn't that he doesn't have shapeshifter syphilis <laughs> yeah, but, yeah but it's not a threat yeah. it's like you, you will are getting but it, i think <laughs> it, it's you know it's a it's it's just the way the boys do it where she goes okay I get you were yes, duped, absolutely. you know, yeah. and I accept that, you know, because Huey says how he kind of knew in the end that it wasn't mm -hmm. her. Yeah. Um, she so, found her keys in less than 10 minutes <laughs> yeah, because exactly. she's normally absolutely freezing everywhere she goes and the uh, and the shapeshifter was uh, was sweating. Um, <laughs> and because when she wore a really hot looking outfit at home when normally she puts on her uh, her sweatpants the minute she walks in through the door because she cannot possibly wear designer clothes in the house basically. Yeah. So I thought Yui knows all the little stuff about her. So. But I, I thought this was all really good because, you know, because Singer survives, it sets up a, a a spooked Newman who then is calling up Huey mm -hmm. and effectively, you know, a determined Homelander that is willing to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I do like what he says to Newman, there is no fail. Um, if you back down, you know, then I will cause pain for your daughter for the rest of her life and yeah. send bits of her to you, all this kind of stuff, you know, real terrifying. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, but it, it kind of kicks off that kind of end game mm -hmm. bit really here. Yeah. And so it, it was a great part for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and it does kick off, I guess, what my boy's moment is as well. Uh, Newman going and talking to Huey and telling him that she wants his help and that they will be able to be on the same side kind of inspires Huey to give his speech to the rest of the team, um, partly because Newman says, well, you know, you do something to me, I do something to you. And it's always going to get worse and worse and worse as it goes yep. on. So Huey's speech to the team, I thought was really, really good. And again, you know, let's say to make the world a little less tense. Yeah, maybe we need to step back and forgive or show mercy because that is more brave than just showing hate and murdering people all the time which is, has been the boys modus operandi since the beginning of the show it's been about let's go out and kill them before they kill all of us basically or let's go and kill them uh, after they kill some of us whatever it may be it's it seems to be escalating over and over again and huey's made this idea now he said this is it we have to make a final stand and we have to be more human to fight these monsters effectively. So um, I thought that moment of inspiration for the team, it leads to Frenchie and, and Kamiko starting to get the idea that maybe they can forgive themselves. Um, maybe that is an approach they can take rather than just holding on to the guilt and venting in, it in anger all the time. Um, I like MM and, uh, and Annie joining the calls by just going, yeah, effort. Why not? <laughs> Let's go out with our head heads held high. Is basically yeah. Well, their I plan, mean, that, so. exactly. But, but I like how they, you know, for MM, it's like, well, you know, we we rolled the dice with A train, and look how that turned out. Mm -hmm. We didn't think that was going to turn out the way it is. Yeah. Um. So I. I kind of liked that it was all a bit flippant. It was like, okay, sure, let's give it a go. You yeah. know, they still got the contingency of well, if she even looks and blinks her eyes funny absolutely there will be frenchy there with the virus yeah. aiming for the soft tissue and so on you know yeah. so i kind of i like the fact that it, it we'll give this a not, go but not a hundred percent behind us yeah yeah and i mean you know the fact that in a sense we'll never know but you know yeah 
Yeah, I never know how well it could have gone, but they were all aligned mm. with a good new leader of the boys, as opposed to MM, who was totally stressed out, and Billy, who just wants to kill everything in his path. <laughs> uh, here we have Huey, who's actually kind of stepping up to be a leader in a way, and telling them this is a way they could be able to work through it. Uh, one other little interesting nod that's in there of uh, of Huey as he nods back to um, another choice he made this season, which was to be instantly angry with his mother. Uh, the minute she came back into his life, oh, such um, a good speech. Yeah. So interesting that he's saying, you know, uh, it's the wrong choice because I could have, you know, I could have had some time with my mother since I was a kid. Um, so this is the lesson that he learned after his father died. The last thing his father taught him, and he's going to bring it into his life with the boys. So I thought it was really a really good way to finish Huey's arc for the season, I suppose, after everything that he's been through, mostly on his own or with his family. Um, so a good way to to bring that back into the team. Yeah, yeah definitely. Oh, great, excellent. That's it for our boys' moments, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's get on to our seven or antagonist moments for the episode. You're not the real heroes. I'm the real hero. Who is the real hero? Well, definitely not the seven or Homelander, but guys, who wants to kick us off with their seven moments for the episode? I'll jump in. All right. Um, Because this is a bit of one. It's not really seven. It's not really... I'm going to call Butcher... Our antag- my antagonist moment mm-hmm. for this episode. Very much towards mm-hmm. the end. To be- not talking about the, the Mallory aspect, which we'll get discussed later. Uh-huh. Um, he is now fully souped up, uh, V-roided, tentacle-waving mm. uh, butcher. Um, he The grey in his beard is gone. He is back to how he looked in season one. Mm-hmm. And he has poisonous whipped tentacles flying from the tumor in his chest and he whips Vic in half. Mm-hmm. He is on he he is a man on a mission to kill the soups, to kill Homelander, and that's what he's gonna do uh, come hell or high water. Yeah. And it really cements him now as an antagonist of the boys. Mm-hmm. He is now outside of uh, outside of the CIA, he's outside of the the boys. He's outside of everything that he was. Yeah, yeah. he's against Ryan. He, like we saw this deterioration, this downturn of Butcher. Butcher was never a good person. No, no. Like he was always. He called it to himself. He was always the a hole, mm-hmm. trying to sometimes do the right thing, which in his mind was get the soups who were taking advantage or doing the bad things. Yeah. There was to keep the soups in line. That's what the boys were doing. Because originally they'd killed his wife, or that's what he thought. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's really just kind of cemented over time. Mm-hmm. He we saw him talk to himself throughout this season about how he would lie to himself mm-hmm. about things that to to tell the perfect story for himself to yeah. make himself more of the bad guy. He's just now fully embraced that. He mm-hmm. is he, he the the Jeffrey Dean Morgan character said, I am you. Yeah. You are me. You just a different aspect. And that he has now embodied that aspect that just has no attachments. Yeah. I, I love he, that. Uh, he's he, singular minded. I love that in the in the clip from last week's episode. What happened in last week's episode, where Kessler says uh, to uh, Billy Butcher, "When I say you want to blow up the entire world, when I say you want to commit genocide, you do because I am you, and that yeah. is your thought. Like it's it's yeah. not I'm not someone possessing you like a ghost coming in. I, this is your thought. <laughs> your thought is you yeah. want to commit genocide. So, and a great touch at the end as Billy drives off, looks in the mirror, and it's Joe Kessler's face looking back at him. You know, I kind of had said." When Billy passed out at the end of the last episode, I wonder, does that mean now Joe takes over the body, basically? They didn't go yeah. that way. They went with him in hospital. We'll talk about that in a second. But the end of the episode actually does kind of indicate what I said last week. It is Joe Kessler now inside the body, possessing him almost, uh, now being that side of Billy that can do these kind of things where he'll rip apart a woman in front of his daughter. He'll rip her in half, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Even Billy usually wouldn't have gone that far in the past, but yeah. uh, this version of Billy seems to go as far as he wants to. Well, exactly. I mean, it's it's the fine dividing line, isn't it, between him and Homelander? Somewhere in the, the midriff, yeah. They are like, <laughs> literally both, to some degree, as bad as one another. Mm-hmm. It's just one is soup, 
souped up. Yeah. The other isn't. But the other Maybe one has. <laughs> but there are, to a greater or lesser degree, mm. um, you know, empathy and understanding. Yeah. It, I think that's the great thing about this timing of this, where he, you know, you've just had Huey's stirring speech around uh-huh. sort of mercy, you know, trying to flip Newman, trying to reason with the rest of the boys that, you know, we're human. Yeah. You know, ever since I've become a part of the boys, death, killing, murder has been normalized. I used to be shocked by it. And, mm. um, and, you know, that's not necessarily the answer. We can do it differently. Yeah. And he's kind of, like you say, it's all on board. And literally, Captain Chaos arrives with, you know, with Joe Kessler in the saddle. Yeah. Um, and out comes the the killing sort of fronds or whatever they are the worms um and yeah rips newman in in shreds it's like basically like yeah thanks Hugh. i mean it's even just that he puts his hand on huey's shoulder mm-hmm. and then just grabs him to move him out the way yeah out they come newman dead i mean effectively his daughter zoe as well is crashed into the yeah. um the the shelving i don't he's know knocked whether, her out, yeah yeah he's knocked yeah. her out and of course, like in his usual kind of way, he says, if I were you lot, I wouldn't hang about. He knows what's about to come, in a sense. Absolutely. Um, and at his final words to the Meyer, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I loved I loved yeah. that because it, it feels like like you say, Chris, Butcher from the first few uh, well, the first season at least, this kind of real kind of bit of a tosser, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they, but he, he's the, he's that character. Like yeah. a lot of people would assume he's the anti-hero, right? Mm. He's not. No. The, like the the hero of the boys is Huey mm-hmm. yeah. and the other boys. Yeah. And that's what they've done throughout the four seasons, and will do in the fifth season to show that the boys secretly are being redeemed, and like MM is getting his place. J- yeah. Like Starlighter is evolving and to become a better star a better person at the end of the huey's evolving but butcher's devolving yeah, yeah. and yeah. i i think that's why those those little visual um tropes of showing the same scene but from the the viewpoint of homelander and then billy butcher mm. are just yeah. so on point because it's actually yes. saying really in effect these people are not that different um, and yeah. you yes. know in a sense pity ryan or pity the boys because they're having to deal mm-hmm. with the ego and manicness Absolutely. of these two and so it and the seven and then we'll talk about yeah. it as well but you know the homeland is treating the seven the way that billy butcher treats the boys like you know they're just a tool that he'll use them uh, and if they don't uh, shape up he'll cut them loose basically and yeah. um, now we have in the past had billy on the opposite side to the boys in the other seasons of the show, but this is a real definitive cut here. Uh, if if the team escape the finale of what happens here at the end of this season, um, Billy could also be another antagonist for the next season. So I totally understand why you have this in your antagonist moment, Chris. It's it it makes sense that I don't think we're going to have a happy happy clappy team up of the boys again uh, in the next season. No, exactly. No. But yeah, so that's my moment. Grant, well, I, I'll come in for for my mm-hmm. uh, seven moment because, in a sense, it's Billy Butcher as well, just mm-hmm. with a bit of added Homelander, and it's the the events sort of preceding, really. I think what what you've just sort of raised there, and um, because as I say, Ryan has been kind of open to interpretation. Let's put it that way through this season, and even just like in um the last season mm-hmm. as well and like any adolescent early teens whatever who knows where they're necessarily going to land will they be the rounded person that you want them to be or will they be the nightmare that you wish you'd never had kind mm-hmm. of thing and in a sense it's <laughs> like here it is being captured between these two fathers one his biological father but raped his mother the other the surrogate stepfather mm-hmm. who to be honest never wanted much to do with him after yeah. he realized it was a soup but 
loved his mother so much that was willing to give it a go. And it it's it's that opening up um with Homelander finding that picture that kind of in a sense the crisis point for these two men is Rebecca not because of her but because of their own egos yeah. and and, yeah. and everything and you know Homelander saying to Ryan come here and Ryan you know rebelling against that and literally just walking out only mm-hmm. to be phoned up to go into what you would think of of Billy Butcher's last breath and last throw of the dice really here um, to bring Ryan on board. You know, th- th- there was always that conversation earlier on between in the season between Billy Butcher and Joe Kessler. Um, I say conversation, but effectively him speaking to him, his other side of his personality. Yeah. <laughs> um, of you know either we can turn him and use him for our own purposes or he'll have to be killed yeah. and you have here in a sense that other part of billy butcher before the worms and victoria newman um and being ripped in half where billy is trying to make sure that he honors the request of becca mm-hmm. and to protect uh Ryan and in the end Grace Mallory's sort of insistence to try and keep Ryan there because I do like the juxtaposition between Grace and Billy Butcher yeah, here in this moment in the hospital where you know Grace kind of force, forces the issue really for Ryan to stay then he realizes he's actually in another huge sort of underground complex that he mm-hmm. could be trapped in and um, just like his his father used to be yeah and um, it was billy in the end wants ryan to choose he's like he says if you feel safer with homelander mm-hmm. then stay if not you know go with mallory yes um and you know ryan needs time to think but grace just pushes it mm. just too much for ryan to sort of you know lash out really but with his strength yes um you know so r.i.p mallory here yeah like, i was like fairly shocked that she was killed actually i wasn't i, I really wasn't expecting it but yeah i like the fact that her deteriorated relationship with um with billy in a sense drove her to try and go beyond you know you had billy trying to like Calm down. Don't tell him all this stuff. You know, take yeah. it easy. But Billy's basically saying, we have an opportunity here. We can talk through this stuff with Ryan, but we can't overload this yeah, child exactly. with all of this information exactly. right now. And Mallory is kind of going, yeah, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen? You could have an aneurysm right now and die right in front of him. And we haven't, we, we don't have time for this, basically, with Billy. He's, she's trying to get that information out as soon as possible. Um, I don't think Ryan kills grace mallory um he's not pushing her to kill her i don't think he's aggressively pushing her enough i think this is another situation of ryan having no idea how to use his force when he's angry um the same way that he killed the stuntman and threw him across an entire street and into a building and crushed him earlier on in the season that's kind of what happens here with grace i think he's pretty shocked but still kind of going i still need to get out of here and goes yeah um i thought i was surprised he didn't take a little pause and go oh my god i can't believe i just did that he just walked out of there but he's so determined to get out but i think Um, this is the difficult read on ryan Mm -hmm. because you say that but he knows exactly how strong he is because he killed the stuntman so he knows if he does too much with grace it could be potentially lethal but i i don't think he knows how to control that because nobody's training him nobody's helping him nobody's telling him how to use his powers homelander's going you're as powerful as i am and you're going to be the new homelander and new leader of the seven billy butcher literally just told him and grace has just told him um we're going to train you up to be the person fighting against homelander that's how powerful you are but nobody's going right do a half punch here or a third punch here and this is the result of it and he put i think he just pushes grace out of the way and she smacks her head head against the wall and dies. It's not intentional that he was trying to knock her out even. Um, I totally to agree with you. His, his yeah. whole thing was, I don't want to be trapped down here. Yeah. And he pushes her, but his push is the push of someone. Yeah. And yeah, he, he chucks her off her feet 
at the wall and she smashes her head. I mean, she yeah. effectively had her skull crushed. Um, um, neck broken, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. yeah. I totally agree with you. I don't think that he wanted to do that, but yeah. I just feel he's so ambiguous because mm-hmm. even after the stuntman, then you see how he is when he was influenced by Homelander. Yeah. And it's about the influence. So actually, he's hugely suggestible. Exactly. And this is the great yeah. thing about this character is that you don't know. Because you're right. He didn't stop and mourn anti Mallory yeah. that he used to know. He loved meeting her and seeing her for the for you know for the first time in a long time. Yeah. But then the upshot of their interaction is he hasn't been able to process anything, not even living with Homelander, because he's just no. keeping out of his way. Absolutely, yeah. Let alone this tinderbox situation. Yeah, and this is his third murder so, now since he got his powers. Yeah, you know, he killed Becca. He, he's he's killed Grace now, and he's killed uh, he killed the stuntman. Um, and nobody's stopping to go. Oh, hang on a second, we really need to control this, or we need to take care of this, or this is how you should be taking care of this, Ryan, and talking to him. That's kind of what Billy wanted to do. Um, but to your point about Joe Kessler, uh, again, this is why having a really good actor like JDM in the role of Joe Kessler as the voice behind uh, behind uh, Billy Butcher is such a great idea because there's a moment in the conversation when Ryan's kind of turning all the plans down and you just see Joe over in the corner yeah. going, well, killing him it is then. You know, it's like, it's having that, this spoken thing that's uh, again we are now inside billy's head we know this is what billy's actually saying when he's looking yeah. at his son he's going well time to kill him then you know those were the options i i do wonder uh now mallory is no more mm. i think the actress who plays mallory will and mallory will be back next season as a third potential personality in Trying to fight oh, yeah. with Becca yeah. against JDM. Interesting. A Sessler in yeah. Butcher's Head. That'd be really cool. That could that's because cool. I see cause that's like another a person who was so instrumental in his life. Uh-huh. Mallory has been. And I think that's a good way to keep that. So there will be always this cast of characters talking yeah. with Butcher. Um, but because I was shocked when they killed Mallory. Yeah, yeah I mean, shocked. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I was. Because I was like, Especially and how they did it, yeah. I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, it's okay because it's kind of how they brought Becca back a bit. They're able now. I, I, okay, yes, it's a it's a bit of a trope having this. Oh, it's inside someone's head, but it's a, still a good thing because they these the tumors are almost acting independently mm-hmm. as separate characters on themselves. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so. Well, it's, yeah, it's I, part I of the right. show now itself, I guess. That's that's kind exactly. of the point you're, you're, you're making. I get it. You know, it's it's not it's not a trope now that it's part of Billy Butcher's character. Exactly. He has people that will talk to him. Um, yes. But yeah, it, 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 it was a real surprise. I suppose it's because of Mallory's speech to Ryan. Ryan has seemed, um, while you know poorly influenced at times and you know again a kid so he hasn't he hasn't developed where he wants to go with his life yet so i i t- totally get that but her speech to him saying you know he she when she lost her grandkids the the massive hole that was left behind and then ryan came in as this shining light and they lived together for months you know she was on the run with him for months in the past so yeah. the two of them absolutely became a family unit when butcher wasn't around and when becca wasn't around and homelander wasn't around they became a family unit i thought that was getting through to Ryan. But then it's almost like panic stations because the same thing that Homelander had been warning him about for so long, this idea that they will trap you, they will force you to do what they're going to do just like they did with me, um, is going to happen to you at some point. And he realized that this is another one of those bunkers that that you've created to put me into. Um, So he's like, get out, get out, get out, uh, no matter what stands in my way. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a great scene though and a real surprise. Yeah, absolutely. Derek, uh, what about yourself? I want to talk about Homelander um, and how far he's gone in this episode and how far <laughs> the rest of the seven have gone as well. Um, you know, the the scenes last of the last couple of episodes with uh, The Deep and um, Black Noir effectively being the henchmen for uh, for Homelander when they went out and tried to kill the boys in, uh, in their office. Um, we saw that. We loved that. There were great scenes. But in this episode, there's something more insidious about it when Homelander mm-hmm. kicks Ashley out of the room and tells them, right, here's the real plan. The president's going to die today. When he does, everything erupts in 
riots. We're going to be bringing in every soup around to take care of them. But first, between now and when the president dies, we have to take out everybody involved that has any type of information about me or, well, you guys as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but anybody who had any, any information on me, they all have to die. And the deep's like, yep, no problem, sir. Not a problem. <laughs> Anybody else? Can we add Ashley to the top of that list? <laughs> you know, that's kind of his, uh, that's, that's the deep. He is now fully on board. Uh, now that he's lost Ambrosius and uh, learned what happened with Sage and the, and, and the Black Noir um, before. Yeah, it's interesting. I thought there'd be a bit more tension between Black Noir and the deep this mm. episode, but nope. it didn't feel like that at all. They were all broing it again. Yep, they're back so to bros. Yeah. I guess, yeah, the deep is already lobotomized so he just doesn't hold on to that stuff really <laughs> well oh fish brain he's you know? a fish brain five um, seconds oh okay yeah black noir <laughs> how are you well exactly but they're also fully stormtroopers now for um for homelander they will do whatever he commands um you know we we have the scenes of the vault employees running through the building uh being chased down by first firecracker who's not looking pretty good at the moment she's gotten quite sick from the tablets yeah. that she's she's been taking to uh to uh please homelander um, i initially thought that was possibly the virus yeah. actually so did i yeah yeah um, yeah, I and, really thought that's how they were gonna say oh secretly they'll introduce yeah um, exactly and i thought the mix of having uh firecracker being sick and also the changeling as well having you know i'm burning up in here this place is so hot you know i thought ooh, there's two soups that seem to be having health problems at the yeah. moment um, maybe the maybe the virus has gone airborne and the, we just don't know about it that this is the effect that it's having on people here so yeah totally totally with you on that but uh but firecracker did make me laugh when she was like oh just stop running and then just shoots the guy in the back to get him to stop so she can she doesn't have to run after him anymore uh, and then the deep taking out one of the writers from uh from vault terror as well one of the ones that we've seen uh throughout the seasons of the show um but not before he um, makes the guy tell him that he's a very intelligent member uh, and the <laughs> most respected, after Homelander, of course, most respected member of the Seven. Uh, and yeah, I I don't know. Uh, Jace Crawford plays this part so well that I was, that when he said to the guy, you know what, that's enough for me. Um, I know you're saying it just because you're afraid, but that's enough for me. That's all I want. I actually thought he was going to let him go until he uh, pounds his face into Absolutely. dust. Um, so brutal. Yeah. Really awful. Um, and uh, even poor other Ashley <laughs> um, getting killed by Black Noir because it's like, I've killed Ashley. That's the wrong Ashley. There's too many Ashleys. Many Ashleys. Still Everybody around here is called <laughs> Ashley. Yeah, yeah. And he gets his murder boner uh, yeah. like the real Black Noir. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I did like as well in Fort News when um, Homelander tells Ashley uh, he needs all the files on anyone in Vought who has intel on him, all the seven, but mainly me. Yeah. Um, and there's just, again, an exchange between the Ashleys uh-huh. there um, like, <laughs> in we the are back corridors free. of the, yeah. uh, you know, of, of the TV studio. And I just thought, uh, actually, another RIP Ashley, because <laughs> it was such a good concept, these two Ashleys. Yeah. Free. Really, really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, really fun. But I just, just that moment for me, the, that's my big antagonist moment. The fact that Homelander has now been able to get the other three members of the seven, still not a seven, um, to, <laughs> to follow every single command he gives them effectively. So I uh, thought that was, I uh, thought that was really interesting and pretty scary as well. Uh, cause they are now, you know, again, the deep, we wouldn't think of him as that massively violent a person. And look what he did, uh, to someone he worked side by side with for four or five years now at this stage uh, in the writer from uh, from uh, the Vought Studios, yeah. right? So, uh, and just punched him straight through the face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go on to our other outstanding moments from the episode. Thank you. You have five minutes to make your openings. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll take on um, my outstanding moment here because it does follow on with all the Vought employees mm-hmm. being killed uh, and Ashley... Um, overhearing um, Homelander telling the remaining members of the Seven um, the actual plan. And she hears um, the Deep Mm -hmm. uh, talking about killing her as well. 
just before I go into uh, the actual point, I just love this actress, Colby Minifee, because mm-hmm. I like when Homelander tells her to leave and starts the door uh, for the uh, meeting room going. She's kind of like, I, I can make it, I can make it, and it's like starts running because, you know, dropping all the stuff uh, yeah. again. Um, and I just like, it's just such an unusual choice, but it actually, I found it really funny. Oh, I had to um, know, there's just something, yeah, it's Firecracker that pushes the door button when Homelander kicks Ashley out. And it's just, it's just that look on Firecracker's face going, you don't belong here. You're just one of those humans yeah. kind of thing. It's just like, get the hell out of here. But we it, all, we have the power in this place. Yeah. But it's almost like, uh, a, like a lab rat being asked yeah. to sort of get through this next test, which exactly. is get yourself out this room before the big fire doors close. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I love the fact that as soon as she hears the actual plan, she is straight down to Homelander's mm. um, uh, room and injects herself with V. Her wig comes off. Yes. And I'm like, uh, we don't actually see what transformation yes. is happening to yeah. her, how the V is going to take shape. You forgot about the wig, though, didn't you, John? And I did, because I thought yeah. that was it. Yeah. But... Um, and then I was like, oh, no, she has a wig. Yeah. And then we don't see her for the rest of this episode. So I actually did think those moments in the corridor where Black Noir had just killed other Ashley and you'd got the thing with the writer. I thought we were going to see v Ashley mm. coming in here going, you know, well, you're not taking me or yeah. whatever. Uh, but no, we don't see what has befallen or become of her so that i can't wait for season five yeah um because i would say a veed up ashley could be really really funny it could be very very interesting yeah we just see we just see the brain um through her skull we see it kind of pulsating that's the yeah. only indication i i really did feel and i know it's probably just because the wig came off but it really felt like the transformations from roald dahl's the witches um that's, yes that's, the, yeah. that's what i thought that we, they were going for that kind of style but yeah we don't we don't have an indication of what the power is that you're getting from uh from vr but uh yeah it was instantly oh god i'm gonna die right time for me to finally take that yeah thing. exactly I know exactly where it is you know so and in fairness to her you know I totally understand that. And, um, you know, so we don't see her again. So actually, and just another thing on a disappearance, because we don't get A-Train back mm-hmm. in this episode either, which I no. thought we were going to see A-Train somehow. I mean, even certainly down to the uh, the title of, <laughs> of, of the episode, Assassination Room. I yeah. was like, oh, okay. I actually thought A-Train might die in this episode. But Ooh. we don't see him at all. Interesting. You know, there's a moment with the um, shapeshifter who says to Annie, "You're the fir- you were never the first choice to yeah. be the person that I would take on the look of." Was she maybe thinking a train could have been could have been the the person that they'd replace and uh, and he'd do the assassination? I don't know. And they couldn't find him because he left the city last episode, as we, yeah. as we know. But Maybe. I wonder if he was the one that they it were saying. It could be, could because be Sister Sage did know about him, so it could have just been the way to... You he know, was the proper patsy yeah. to, you know, it could have been better than uh, than her. Um, yeah, I, I just I just wonder when you said that. Because, yeah, we, did, we didn't get him. We got a mention of him in uh, in the speech, as we said earlier on, uh, from M. Um, so so kind of like the feedback was saying um, earlier on about this potentially just leading into season five rather than it being a definitive ending for, uh, for season four. Yeah, it, it will absolutely lead on to next episode. I'm sure we're going to see a train coming back uh, in some capacity next episode, uh, the first of, of season five. I'm sure yeah. we're going to see him. I'd say so. He's going to be help spring the boys, mm. but I'd say that's kind of personally what I think. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, anything else on Ashley, John? No, that was it. Chris, do you want to give us your outstanding moment from the episode? Yeah, very quickly for me, it's just setting up Soldier Boy back. He is mm. for season five. Yeah, end of season three. We know both of them survived himself and Maeve. Mm-hmm. Maeve goes into Witsec and Soldier Boy. Oh my god, Maeve and Witsec. Yes, she is. Yeah. Maeve and AJ are now both are on the run. Yeah. They I'm could glad. potentially come back for season 5. Yeah. Just thought about that one as you said yeah. talked about AJ and I went, "Oh, yeah. Maeve. Yeah, she survived too." I'm really glad you mentioned that because I remembered Queen Maeve still being alive. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it, yeah. I was surprised we hadn't seen her in this yeah. season so far. Yeah. Interesting. And there's yeah. been a few little nods, you know, that the um, the copybook that uh, that uh, Sage has is a Queen Maeve uh, copybook. It's not like the character's been forgotten in the show at all, yeah. but she's there somewhere, but uh, taking a year out, I guess, <laughs> from uh, from the boys. So I think it's highly possible we could get uh, yeah. the, the character back next season. That'd be cool. Very good. Anyway, back to Soldier Boy. Yes. So last season ago, we saw at the end uh, Mallory taking Soldier Boy back into custody, her version of custody, mm -hmm. into a black op room, into the gas filled chamber. I thought that was it. Right. The fact that we see Homelander basically finding him again because of the new president, because he was brief. Mm, yeah. I'm like, Oh God, what are you setting up next episode, next season? <laughs> because the possibility like, they were antagonists against each other's, but then also both had a very particular view of how it could be done. Uh huh. I'm like, oh, you really like they're setting up going with the Star Wars analogy, the Darth Vader and Palpatine uh -huh. <laughs> going against Luke and like they're setting it up into the next season. Well, really, in that analogy, Chris, it's actually Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker teaming up together, father and son, to take yeah, over the galaxy. Sorry, so yes. maybe they're maybe that's their twist on on the Star Wars mythology. What if father and son did actually team up to take on the galaxy? But there is a, uh, there is another. But there is another. And there is another. So then it's Luke's kid, uh, father, father, son, <laughs> and grandson. I guess if Ryan stays yeah. on their side, that's three of them, right? So, yeah. yeah be interesting uh but yeah it was it was a, a great way to have uh soldier boy come back at the end um and you know it uh, we'll probably talk about it in a second but this idea that the president has sworn an oath almost to homelander above the us above the people above the party above everything else that's there he's sworn an allegiance to homelander so when he gets his briefing becoming the new president the first thing he does and goes he goes um, do you know this thing that's being hidden from you is Soldier Boy is still alive and they've got him here, right? Come on over and I'll show you exactly where he is. It's like having a direct report from the highest of office to the now even higher office, I yeah. guess, of Homelander. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, a great little post credit scene there. Yeah, and it just sets up a lot for next season. Exactly. Just the possibilities outside of just what is set up uh, as an end credit kind of post credit view yeah, yeah. It's great so that was mine i just completely because he was just taken off the board the last season mm -hmm. i was just like I did, did not expect it yeah to be to return i thought that was just kind of the end yeah but no be quite, they always have a plan quite cool to see justin eckles back uh next yes. episode um my, my outstanding moment is really all of our outstanding moments i'm yeah. sure the outstanding moment uh for everybody is how this this season ends with all of the cliffhangers we talked about the first major one which is butcher coming back in um and killing off uh newman taking the weapon so he now has the weapon and he's on the road probably to go and shove it uh, somewhere uh, up Homelander if he can get uh, a, a, an ability to do so. Uh, but the rest of it, where we have Sage, and Sage returning. So yep. Sage has always been involved in this plan. She knew the plan from the start. She even knew that Homelander was eventually going to cut her off and kick her out, um, and that he would make multiple different choices. Um, and she planned for all of those eventualities. Everybody's speculation about Sage potentially just working for herself and work or being a good guy we're all wrong she does want to complete the plan for homelander and knew how to achieve it even if he wasn't going to listen to her like absolute brilliance and when at that moment when her eyes go a bit wild when he said i treated you like garbage why did you do this and she goes because i wanted to prove to myself that i could but that's um, that's what i loved about absolutely it. loved it yeah. and it was also the scary thing because that, like, I thought, oh, okay, she's going to switch. She's going to be the good sage. Um, you know, but actually, it's even more frightening is that despite being able to extricate herself from the whole thing, you know, and she managed to get out without her brains being in a bucket, mm -hmm. she's that clever. She's put in all the fail safes to account for the stupidity the 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 um the the ego of homelander who believes he's 
better than humanity, but isn't necessarily, at least when it comes to um, the mind and the mm-hmm. brain. But it's that she just said, I wanted to just see if I could do it. Yeah. Even because more she's that clever, it's like, otherwise I'm bored. And yeah. in a sense, it comes back to her, well, I came up with a can- cancer cure mm-hmm. in, you know, seven hours after my gram. Yeah. It's that she does it because she can. Yes. It's literally her superpower, and that's why she exactly. did this. Yeah. She was bored, unchallenged, and nobody was listening to her when she was at home. And she could still agreed. make it work. Yeah. And oh, I liked well, yeah. how it played out, actually. I yeah. liked how it played out. Yeah. And even better, as she walks out, <laughs> it was a, her turn to Homelander going, now get ready for phase two. I've got even bigger plans. And you're going, what is she planning for yeah. the big finale in season five? Why is she going to put Homelander, I guess, king of the world? I, um, yeah, Possibly. Something, or something phase like two that. is yeah. another coup, you know? Yeah. As in, you know, who well, knows? Yeah. Um, but great, really good. I like the fact that as well, she comes in with a balloon uh-huh. just to celebrate the success. Yeah. And he's like, what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's really good. That's tuck. really good. Um, and then the other position that Homelander is in is that he's now uh, the leader of all of the deputized superheroes all across America. They are all now being deputized and he is going to be over all of them. So effectively the new minister of war for the US, <laughs> I guess, or the minister of all policing um, for all, all of America. And we know that the president has pledged his allegiance to Homelander, as I said, so uh, because of the phone call that uh, that Sage comes in with. So, um, yeah, so well, I don't know whether the public know that. They know that he... The, the, the public aren't seeing the president um, swearing allegiance to Homelander. They're saying he's just saying that the um, all the soups are deputized and reporting to Homelander. But there is a little bit of a moment uh, as he's making the press conference that Homelander kind of pushes him out of the way mid sentence to make his speech to his new public, though, so, uh, which I thought was kind of a good. A yeah, good no, that moment. was a nice yeah. little touch, actually. Well, he's he's out to root the deep state star lighters. Yes, he is. Which includes, um, effectively, the boys on the run. And there's yeah. the big moments, of course, the big moments that happen um, with the boys as they break up and go their separate ways. We've, again, a- another scene that we've seen play out in previous seasons as they go to different parts of the country, as they all separate uh, away from each other uh, in the past. Not as bad when they go to ground. Um, here we see uh, Kamiko and Frenchie going one way, M.M. going another way, uh, Huey and, and Ali going uh, their own separate way. Uh, it's kind of a planes, trains and automobiles uh, bit. We have... Uh, we have yeah. Frenchie and Kamika going to uh, go into the shipyard to, to get their boat away from the US and uh, they're confronted by the two major characters from Gen V. Gen v. Um, yeah, we have Case and Sam back. Sam, I hope this doesn't spoil anything for Gen, Gen V. You should have watched it by now, uh, fellow boys and yeah. girls. Um, but Sam is still f- fully in thrall of Kate. Um, he is still under her ba- under her power, um, still doing her bidding. You can see it from his eyes. He hasn't, He's he's not engaged at all he's still doing her will he's holding Kamiko while Kate does exactly the same thing to Frenchie she converts Frenchie under her control again so um the reason why I want to just highlight that again is because in Gen V Sam was turned to Kate's side and his girlfriend tried to do that thing of but I love you come back to my side they've already done it in Gen V where the love interest of the character tries to get him back over yeah by you know, proclaiming her love to him. And it didn't work for Sam. The fact that in this episode, Kamiko and Frenchie got together, had their kiss, there's nobody more important in the world to each other than them. You would think in another show, that means that Kamiko can stand in front of Frenchie in future and go, but I love you, come back to me. They've already done it. They've already tested that on Kate's powers and that doesn't break Kate's powers. Yeah, no. So interesting just to note that, that, even though we've seen the two of them come together, that's not going to be what breaks Frenchie out of the thrall of Kate uh, next season. It'll be something no, killing else. Killing Kate does. Yeah, potentially. That is yeah. literally yes. Taking her arm uh, yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> and great to have Mother's Milk knocked down by Love Sausage as well in the airport. Um, yeah. Who else but Mother's Milk's uh, nemesis? 
yeah. in, in the love of sauce. <laughs> it is his nemesis, isn't it? it? Is. You know, it, it, is. it adds to that joke yeah. of the uh, the person that his wife was was sleeping <laughs> with, the the um, the Homelander fan where everybody was slagging him off because he clearly has a much bigger member than M.M. is the joke that they keep saying. That's why she left M.M. and went to this uh, this home, Homelander supporter. And here we have Love Sausage coming in and uh, he's the one that captured M.M. So there's definitely a size thing with M.M. Uh, here. It definitely is. And, <laughs> and a Purell hand sanitizer thing because yeah, it's just like... it's. Th- I don't even think the fact that it is a love sausage that beats him down. It's the germs on that love sausage (laughs) and the need to, the OCD need to be sanitized uh, and clean. It could be. It could be. Uh, So funny. And then finally, we have uh, Huey and and Annie um, getting blocked in the middle of the road as a boat is dropped right in front of them on the road. Um, Some members of the Secret Service come in and take Huey away. um, While Cindy a character we haven't seen from season two returns. Uh, Last time we saw her, she was hitchhiking away from the facility where Lamplighter met his end uh, back in season two. We saw her disappear and then thought she was going to be either syncing up with the Seven or maybe joining the boys even (laughs) back in season two. And then we never saw her again uh, throughout all of season three. And here she is back, obviously working for Homelander now and capturing Huey while Annie gets her powers back and flies off. uh, And escapes. and, And escapes. Um, yeah, so Annie's the only member of the team that's free now. Along with Billy, although whether he is a member, not a member of the, of the team... team is no, I know I get yeah, it, but yeah. like Billy is not captured. Yeah, I, f- I feel like what we're probably going to get in this th- throughout the discussions that we've had here, it, it makes, a, makes a lot of sense that what we have is Annie teaming up with A-Train Queen Maeve um, yeah. in the next season of the show. Uh, that's their That's the new boys team to then get the rest of our team back out of uh, of the uh, the concentration camps, I guess, for want of a better word, that the homeland yeah. is going to be putting them into. So, no, yeah. yeah. Well, we did hear that, like, all of the, the superheroes, the Vault superheroes, are now going to be essentially military police. Yes. They're, they're police yeah. force. So yeah. there is going to be some pushback by someone, and I think they'll be the... The Starlighters. Starlighters will become a thing next season. Yeah. But it sets it up... So interesting. Yeah, it's effectively it the superhero up, version of uh, of Handmaid's Tale is coming next season. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and just one of the interesting things, like all of these people coming back, all these characters, you may get this iconic kind of like push between like all of these superheroes. You may mm. get almost like a Civil War Marvels where you're going to have good versus bad superheroes mm. go face to face. And you'll, it's, the boys have made Amazon a lot of money. Yes. I think they could probably offer up. It's like, hey, you're going to get one major scene in the uh-huh. finale of the, the season of your last season. You go for this. Go all out. Yeah. Get your infinite, get your end game moment. There you go. Could and be it. you're going to have all of them rush together. I think that would be very cool. Yeah, that would be very cool if we had tons and tons of superheroes on screen or soups on screen uh, on either side uh, that would be cool like Having, end like, game. hundreds of them exactly like like in Gamer Civil yeah. War yeah uh, it'd be really cool to see them all together in that final season and it seems like bringing that this many you know extra characters back at the end of the season uh, it's possibly a good setup for that uh, next season but between now and then we have Gen V Season 2, which will have its own storyline that will probably play into this as well, which would be very interesting to see. Very excited to see what to do with uh, with Gen V Season 2. Um, anybody have any other points or notes uh, from the episode? Anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about? I have one that I completely forgot to mention. Of course, a massive moment. Kamiko speaking and saying her first words uh, on screen, yeah, shouting no as, uh, as French she's dragged away. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I completely forgot about that, yeah. That that didn't even register with no, me. It didn't register. It, it certainly yeah. registered. I just forgot to say it on the podcast. Yeah. But in my notes, don't forget to mention this. And when I went through my notes, I just saw, oh yeah, don't forget to mention that. <laughs> um, Zoe, the daughter of uh, of Victoria Newman, um, ends off life exactly where Victoria Newman started um, when Red she River. yeah back in Red River. So um, so that's a bit sad when uh, when Victoria Newman with Nadia uh, hidden in in Red River, and now uh, Zoe's ending up back there. That's pretty bad. One very quick one for me, mm-hmm. Giancarlo Esposito. Um, his character is still on the loose. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Will he? How much will Stan Edgar come in mm-hmm. now? Particularly that Vic is dead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Victoria is no more, and 
they both wanted for her daughter not to end up and have a better life. And that was a particular thing. So it's going to be interesting. Who will he blame as well? Because in effect, yeah, it's Billy Butcher that killed her, but mm-hmm. it's Homelander that outed her mm-hmm. um, as yep. well, On which TV, kind yeah. of that snowball. I guess it'll be, it's both of you, but um, yeah. Probably. <laughs> Stan uh, yeah. Edgar versus Billy Butcher and Homelander right yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, you never know. Could be. <laughs> I can imagine it, though. I can imagine it. Like, he's got the most connections mm-hmm. from yeah. being, you know, the former head of Vought. Yeah. So he knows how to play the game. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. That'll be the, the three armies in the Battle of the Three Armies <laughs> season. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Um, anything else left, uh, John? No, nothing from me. Okay, I've got one last one. Uh, I was saving this for the end because just it made me laugh as a Supernatural fan because we have uh, Robert Singer, President Robert Singer. Uh, fans of Supernatural know that the character is named after the character of Bobby Singer uh, from played by Jim Beaver, the same actor in uh, in Supernatural. Um, but they did get to cram in his two best catchphrases. One's heard for about 12 seasons of the show uh, where President Singer here is playing his uh, playing his golf and calls out the words idiot and balls multiple times. Uh, things you would hear Often going into ad breaks uh, of, of Supernatural, you'd hear uh, Bobby Singer uh, calling someone an idiot or just saying balls as the uh, the big plot of the bad guys is revealed. <laughs> so I love that they squeezed them in here because we haven't had a huge amount of Robert Singer. Uh, he's been in the background as the presidential run has been going on. But uh, but as we saw a bit more of in this episode, why not squeeze in his catchphrases, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Nice of Eric to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Guys, what did you think of the episode overall? Uh, Chris, what's your final thoughts on Season 4, Episode 8, Assassination Run? I loved it. I really enjoyed how it set everything up. I enjoyed how they wrapped everything. Um, And I will credit John on this. It is very much your Empire Strikes Back Mm -hmm. ending. Like, the boys, everything is in the low. It's yeah. the lowest that they, they have failed. Their present reports to Homelander mm-hmm. essentially now. Uh, Sage's plan worked. They're all on the run. They're all captured. Yeah. Like everything that they wanted is no more. Yeah. And you even get a high for a moment with Frenchie and Kimiko and that's ripped away. Mm-hmm. They brought everything down to hopefully build to this crescendo for next season. Yeah. And I'm just amazed that they did so much and this episode, this season, really just, it was fantastic writing, some amazing direction, and yep. yeah, absolutely really enjoyed it. Yeah. And some of the performances this season, like, you know, oh, I yeah. Didn't, yeah, even, yeah. didn't even call out um, Daryl Moriarty here, playing both the roles of the shapeshifter and Annie oh, in yeah. scenes against each other, and they're such different, and uh, so, such great characters, having... That that vicious version of Era Moriarty playing the shapeshifter, really attacking Annie January where she lives, you know, about her believing she's better than uh, than everybody else in the world. The, the way she played both roles, I thought, was fantastic. Um, she doesn't get enough praise in this show, uh, but Era no. Moriarty is is absolutely one of the stars of the show. She was she was fantastic. So uh, loads of great performances this season. I'm totally with you, Chris. I, I really yeah. liked season four. And I love now that we have a final season, season five, and it was announced early yeah. enough to know that we this wouldn't be the end. They're not waiting for, you know, building something up to wait for the show to be renewed. I think they did a great job setting up the bigger story of this universe and what's happening here. Uh, Helmlander was more evil than ever, having the most intelligent person on Earth, uh, Sage being at his side, made him even more uh, damaging to the world uh, and yeah every everything seemed ramped up and elevated this season loved it so hoping they can really nail the landing in uh, in season five of the boys uh, john how about yourself what's your what's your final thoughts on uh, this episode um yeah the same i i really enjoyed this episode I'd give it four and a half murder bonus out of <laughs> uh five you do get the sense that season five you know It'd be nice if it was coming along a little quicker. Okay. I know we've got Gen V in, in between, but I think that'll be good because, in effect, that is this continuation. Uh-huh. I think it'd be interesting to see if the the boys that have been captured are in close proximity to those Gen V characters yeah. that are also in custody. I can see that. Um, but so really like that whole thing. I, I I liked how this kind of was left really with 
Vought, Homelander uh, leading it triumphant, effectively leading the country, that most of the people don't know what's going on, don't realize the whole uh, premise for this. Uh, I love the the whole going after the deep state starlighters, you know, just all this made up stuff and um, being <laughs> inspired sort of, by true life. Yes. Well, and being inspired by true life, but it's just it's it's the waste of energy that it is. Mm-hmm. Like it's just so good. I love the the continuous humor through all of this uh, episode as well. I like the light touch with Frenchie and Kamiko. Um, I do like the fact that, in a sense, the boys has kind of gone belly up, not just because they've been captured, but Billy Butcher is effectively off on his own uh, run at the moment. So I, this was just really, really good um, and quite down as well because of where yeah. it was left. Yeah. Uh, especially when you think, you know, the end of season three, you had pretty much they'd combated Stormfront mm-hmm. it felt you know there, there was some positivity hit there I just this just That's feels boy. Yeah. oh no okay yeah. not not a chance the deep yeah. getting worse um, Black Noir effectively realising his true length I guess um, with the attack on and the murder that's that's happening so um, yeah I love this uh, four and a half murder bonus out of five for me excellent stuff yeah yeah um, it's just been such a, such a good season we have one last point of business for the episode guys I think we need a drink uh, after this season we need to go for a beer definitely yeah. it's so roasting at the moment oh, in this podcast room um, I definitely need to drink <laughs> but fellow boys and girls fellow quizzes it is the finale question for this the boys season four pub quiz mm-hmm. uh, pull up a bar stool pour yourself a drink uh, and we will get into question eight which was posed actually by the deep mm-hmm. uh, in this episode what is ashley's last name <laughs> can anybody do it without looking it up on imdb I could. I must admit, I got her name immediately, but I did think it was quite funny that uh, that all of them are sitting around having worked with Ashley for so many years and going, what's her surname? <laughs> Anybody knows? <laughs> Brilliant. John, what's the question? One last time. Sorry. The question is, what is Ashley's last name? And by Ashley, I mean the CEO of Vought, yes. not the other Ashley who came to a gruesome, grisly end <laughs> at the hands of Black Noir. Absolutely. That's it. That is the eighth question of our eight questions for the final Boys Pub Quiz for this season. Um, you can email the correct answers into us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You could be in the chance of getting your hands on some boys goodies. Get all the answers correct into us as soon as possible on our next episode for the boys. What we'll be talking about is um, all of your feedback, which we'd love to hear from you at that email address. And of course, giving you the correct answers for the boys pub quiz. So get get writing. Mm-hmm. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard over these eight episodes and all of season one of Gen V and the previous three seasons of boys coverage make sure you head on over to patreon.com slash tv podcast industries where you can support us for any ongoing monthly amount and help keep the mic and lights running but if you also want to support us with a one-off donation and keep derek in caffeine as he toils away the wee hours and maybe spice up that coffee into an irish coffee <laughs> you can head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash tvpi where you can buy us a coffee or an Irish coffee, depending on your choice, always. And if you can't support us, you ain't got no bucks, no worries. Why not make sure you head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com and subscribe, rate, review, do all the things on all the channels at all the places, because most important, you can also share the podcast with your friends. Tell them all about it, because sharing the podcast is what, gentlemen? Sharing the love. love. Yes, it is. Oh, yes. Of course, we love when you share the love. Um, Yes, thank you so much for joining us. We're uh, we're looking forward to uh, to talking about the uh, feedback on this episode. We want to know what you thought about the finale uh, when we Mm. come back next week. It'll be really interesting to get your thoughts on that. Um, 
And then we have a tiny bit of a break after we finish uh, the boys. We've got a couple of the shows that are coming up. We've got we've got our wrap up of the acolyte. We said we were going to do a wrap up of the yeah. show as it as it finishes off. Um, so send in your feedback on that. Of course, we've got the final season of Umbrella Academy coming out in August. I think it's August eighth. But um, myself and John have kind of a big date going up in August. So I'm not sure exactly whether whether we're going to be able to podcast about Umbrella Academy before well, or we're after not. that. We're not. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because that special Why date not? is because. What? If we do, we'll be getting a divorce as quickly as we're getting <laughs> married, fellow boys and girls. Which is 20 years, so that's not too bad. It is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. a long we're not process podcasting. <laughs> no, we're not, we're not going to be podcasting around the time of our wedding, but we will, we will, I'm sure, cover the final oh, yeah. season of Umbrella Academy at some point. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are looking forward to the big day, uh, finally tying the knot and finally getting married after all these years. Um, oh, I thought you were talking about the yeah. big day of the final, the final season, season of Umbrella Academy. Academy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, that's not. A but I am looking forward to <laughs> Umbrella Academy. Yeah. I can't just wait not as it. much as the wedding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just it can have to just put be put on hold. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, I think I'm sure our fellow uh, our fellow fans of Umbrella Academy will understand. But I've always loved that show. Yeah, um, I yes. love the Umbrella Academy. Yeah. Yeah. So looking forward to talking about that, and of course we will be back with Gen V in the future and uh, the final season of the boys uh, when that comes out as well. Thank you so much to all of our fellow boys and girls for joining us yeah. for this season. But with all that, fellow and justice, boys and girls, and brolly dollies in the future. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh, brolly yes. dollies. Yeah, they'll be coming back. And you acolytes, I can't really, like, acolytes, we're going to need to figure one out for that one-off episode. What do we call them? Just Star Wars fans, I think. Uh, yeah. Star one, uh, Star Wars acolytes. Yeah. We'll figure it out. John will have one by the time we, we come have up with fellow that. rebels, but I yeah, guess yeah, yeah. we need fellow acolytes. We had fellow batchers for the bad batch. Yeah. yeah. We'll work fellow it. Fellow hot we'll... Sith people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we will workshop that between now and then. Absolutely. But from all of us at TV Podcast Industries, we will speak to you soon. We'll speak to you next week. Mm-hmm. And thank you so much. We'll Absolutely. speak to you again soon. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you again next time. Yes, thanks so much, fellow boys and girls, for joining us until the uh, roundup episode, I guess. Yeah. Uh, keep watching, keep listening, and watch out for that love sausage in uh, port bathrooms. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.